Well, may we be numbered amongst those like Mr. John Wycliffe, who stand fast for the cause of truth and godliness. I've been asked to speak on the subject of John Wycliffe. And the history of John Wycliffe is crucial to a true understanding of British and European and even world history. Indeed, I would be so bold as to say that without John Wycliffe under God, there would have been no William Tyndale, and there would have been no John Huss, and there would have been no Martin Luther. And of course, on the course of British and European history, would have been far, far different to what it is. While John Wycliffe was the warden at Canterbury Hall in Oxford in 1367, He had a student, a brilliant student. His name was Geoffrey Chaucer, who, following the steps of his master, reflected much upon the corruptions of the clergy in his famous Canterbury Tales. But he portrays his master when he describes the poor parson. In that Description of the poor parson, this is what Geoffrey Chaucer writes. A good man was there of religion, and was a poor parson of a town, but rich he was of holy thought and work. He was also a learned man, a clerk, that Christ's gospel truly would he preach, his parishioners devoutly would he teach, benign he was, and wonder diligent, and in adversity full patient, and such he was, he proved of tithes. Wide was his parish, and houses far asunder, but he left not for rain nor thunder, in sickness nor in mischief, to visit the furthest in his parish, much and light upon his feet, and in his hand a staff, the noble ensample to his sheep he was. He was a shepherd and not a mercenary, and though he holy were and virtuous, he was to sinful men most not dispicious, nay of his speech dangerous no design, but him his teaching discreet and benign to draw folk to heaven by fairness, by good example was his business." A better priest, I true that nowhere there is. He waited after no pomp and reverence. He made to must spice conscience, but Christ law and his apostles twelve. He taught, and first he followed it himself. So is Geoffrey Chaucer's description of that godly man, the poor parson, John De Wycliffe. John Wycliffe, or John de Wycliffe, was born in the year 1320, born in a little hamlet just to the north of the A66. The A66 is a road that runs from Penrith to the Scotch Corner. And as you travel along that road on the left hand side towards uh, Scotch Corner, there is the town of Barnard Castle. A few miles further along, there is a signpost to Wycliffe. Wycliffe on Tees. Even today, it's just a cluster of houses around the parish church. But Wycliffe was the ancestral home of John de Wycliffe. So he was born in 1320. Incidentally, let me just say concerning his birthplace, Wycliffe, just off the A66. I've mentioned Barnard Castle. Well, just to the north of Barnard Castle is Alton Moor. And it was the family of William Tyndale that came from Alton Moor. It's the Dale of the Tyne, the Dale of the River Tyne. And the family of William Tyndale came from Alton Moor, just a few miles to the north of Barnard Castle. And during the Wars of the Roses, the family fled uh, from the Dale of the Tyne and moved south to Gloucestershire. 
Uh, they changed their name from Tyndale to Hitchens, so that when William Tyndale enrolls at Oxford University, he enrolls not as William Tyndale, but as William Hitchens. And when his father was upon his deathbed, he uh, told William the true identity of the family and their true origins. And from that point, William Hitchens changed his name back to the family name of Tyndale. And then just to the south of Wycliffe, in Masham, in North Yorkshire, was the birthplace of Miles Coverhill. So the three great Bible translators of our English Bible, John de Wycliffe, William Tyndale, Miles Coverhill, all came within a 20-mile radius of each other. There must be something about the air in that part of North Yorkshire. Well, it's a great privilege for me to speak of my fellow Yorkshireman, John de Wycliffe. Born in 1320, he died at Lutterworth in Leicestershire on the 31st of December, 1384. His life was closely connected with Oxford where he was in succession the fellow of Merton College and then the master of Balliol College and finally became a warden at Canterbury Hall. In 1372, he was presented by the king to the rectory at Lutterworth. And it was from Lutterworth in 1374 that he directed his poor preachers who became known as the Lollards, these he often referred to as poor priests, or true men who preach. Wycliffe believed in the primacy and the authority of preaching. Listen to Mr. Wycliffe. O oh, marvellous power of the divine seed, it overturns strong warriors, softens hearts as hard as stone, and renews in the divine image men brutalized by sin and infinitely far from God. He believed, you see, in the power of the word of God, and he believed in the power of the preaching of the word of God. For Wycliffe, preaching was the most important duty of the clergy. There are over 360 of his sermons which still survive to this day. Listen to this evangelical preacher, Dr. Wycliffe. In one of his sermons, lift up, wretches, the eyes of your souls, and behold him in whom was no spot of sin. What pain he suffered for the sin of man. He sweat blood and water to wash thee of thy sin. He was bound and beaten with scourges, the blood running down his sides, that thou shouldest keep thy body clean in his service. He was crowned with thorns that you should think on him and flee all cursed malice. He was nailed, nailed to the cross with sharp nails through hands and feet and stung to the heart with a sharp spear that thy five wits should be ruled by him. That's an example of Wick, uh, Wickless preaching. Preaching Christ crucified, the sinner's only hope. And he instructed his lollards, the poor preachers, to appeal to Holy Scripture in all their exhortations and in all their instructions and in all their teachings. They were to be men of the book. In fact, he considered the word of God of divine and absolute authority in all matters of faith and practice. He had gradually come to this conclusion. In one of his works, Triologus, he writes, We do not sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, or we should abide by the authority of his word, especially that of the evangelists, inasmuch as it is the will of the Holy Spirit that our attention should not be dispersed over a large number of objects, but concerned on one sufficient source of instruction it is his pleasure that the books of the old and new law should be read and studied and that men should not be taken up with other books which, true as they may be, and containing scripture truth as they may, 
by implication are not to be confided in without caution or limitation. What a lesson that is for we who are preachers. Let me just repeat part of that. Shouldn't, that men should not be taken up with other books which may contain scripture truth. My dear friends, how often do we hear preachers and how often am I guilty in my sermons and in my teaching ministry quoting Mr. Calvin, Mr. Spurgeon, Doctor, this professor, that and the rest. Wycliffe told his preachers to preach the word of God and not to be taken up with other books. Oh, we can be so taken up with other books that we neglect the word of God. That applies to preachers, it applies to the congregation. But Wycliffe goes on in another work, he says this, It is impossible that any word or any deed of the Christian should be of equal authority with Holy Scripture. That's important, my friends, because when Wycliffe writes those words, the Pope's authority was absolute. The Pope's authority was greater than that of Holy Scripture. And yet, here is Luther, it is impossible that any word or any deed of the Christian should be of equal authority with Holy Scripture. So that when the Pope asserts that his decrees in matters of faith have the same authority as the gospel, it is Wycliffe's opinion that the Pope is guilty of blasphemy because he is arrogating to himself the attributes and the prerogatives of deity. The Pope opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Because of Wycliffe's views of the authority and the sufficiency of Holy Scripture, he rightly earned the title the Evangelical Doctor or the Gospel Doctor. He had an amazing knowledge of Scripture. He took the different parts of Scripture in close connection with each other. He actually made scripture its own interpreter, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Wycliffe dug deep into the vast mine of scriptural truth, being fully fully assured that if he labored prayerfully in this work, its treasures would be unfolded to his astonished and to his delighted view. And the deep veneration which he felt for Holy Scripture and the supreme importance which he attached to the Word of God led him naturally to the conclusion that the people ought to be allowed to read it in their own mother tongue. And that was a sublime concept. In the day in which Wycliffe lived, and he expressed that view in another work of his called The Wicked, This is what he writes. Those who call it heresy to speak of Holy Scripture in English must be prepared to condemn the Holy Ghost himself. For the Holy Ghost gave the Scripture in tongues to the apostles of Christ to speak the word of God in all languages that were ordained under heaven. And again, in another work entitled The Mirror for Temporal Lords, He says, those heretics are not to be heard, who fancy that secular men ought to know the law of God, but that it is enough for them to know what priests and prelates tell them by word of mouth. For scripture is the faith of the church, and the more it is known in an orthodox sense, the better. Therefore, as secular men ought to know the faith, so it is to be taught them in whatever language is best known to them. In the autumn of 1378, Wycliffe completed one of his greatest treatises, uh, the Latin, De Veritate Sacrae Scripturae, the truth of Holy Scripture. And in that work, he declared, 
The Bible is the divine word of God in Christ, infallible, of sole authority. Lay Lord should read and defend it. No man is so rude a scholar, but that he might learn the gospel in its simplicity. You see, Wycliffe believed that every man, every woman, every child, every young person should be able to read the word of God in their own mother tongue and he believed that if they were able to read it, they would be taught of the Holy Spirit to understand the word of God. The whole Bible. The Bible distributed in a tongue understood by the people. The Bible uncorrupted by the false teaching of that church which claimed for itself an exclusive right to interpret the scriptures. The Bible was to be the moral lever by which his country was to be raised from a state of degradation. That was a sublime concept for the age in which he lived. But my dear friends, that concept still holds today. If Ulster... If the United Kingdom is to be raised from its present state of moral degradation, it will not be the world of politics. It will be the word of God that will lift this nation once more. It wasn't politics that caused the magistrate's court in Balamina to be closed in 1859. It was revival. It was the Holy Spirit coming down upon the word of God, turning the hearts of men and women from their sin, turning them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Wycliffe believed it would be the word of God alone that would raise the land from that state of spiritual degradation. And so he was determined that he would translate the scriptures into his native tongue. Difficulties, apparently insurmountable difficulties, stood in the way of his design. Because his purpose and his design embraced not only the literal translation of the Bible into English for the first time, but also its circulation amongst all the ranks and orders of his fellow countrymen. Wasn't sufficient just to have it translated. Wasn't sufficient for it to be placed on a shelf in some monastic library. His concept was to translate the word of God into English and then to have it distributed to all ranks of society. Many would have shrunk back, terrified by the prospect of the opposition and the persecution that was bound to ensue. Bishops, priests, Many of the laity might have banded together in a dark confederacy against him. He therefore stood in a position of comparative isolation. The translators are wrapped in obscurity. We scarcely find in any of Wycliffe's writings any reference to the progress of the work of the translation itself. For Wycliffe knew that he and those who aided him, if it was blazed abroad, the powerful hand of Roman authority would prevent them from continuing the translation. The consequences are that we are ignorant of the various stages of the work itself, which was to prepare the work, the way for the glorious reformation, and was to affect the spiritual destinies of millions. But the work went on. The Bible was completed by the end of the year 1382. In all probability, it was John Wycliffe who had translated the New Testament and Nicholas of Hereford uh, the Old Testament. When Nicholas of Hereford was forced to flee in 1382, it was revised by John Purvey, 
who was Wycliffe's faithful assistant at Lutterworth and who was known as the librarian of the Lollards. In addition to Nicholas of Hereford and Purvey, Wycliffe was aided by other disciples, perhaps former Oxford scholars. But the translation was completed. It was an exact literal translation of the Latin Vulgate. So great was the eagerness to possess the Bible that those who could not procure the volume of the book, they would give a load of hay just for a few chapters of the precious seed of the word of God. And when they obtained a leaf or several leaves, they would hide the word of God under the floors of their houses and expose their lives to danger rather than surrender the precious book. They would sit up all night, their doors being shut for fear of surprise, reading or hearing others read the word of God. They would bury themselves in woods, and they would converse in silence and solitude from the word of God. Such was their esteem for the word of God. In December, my wife and I, we had to move out of our old property because we were in the process of moving to a newer property, and we had to take temporary accommodation in a friend's house. That house was built at the beginning of the 15th century. Oak timbers everywhere. And I was tempted, sorely tempted, to take up the floorboards to see whether there was underneath evidence of with Cliff's New Testament, that my friend whose house it was assured me he'd had the floorboards up already and there was nothing there. But I was sorely tempted, but there we are. Wycliffe's Bible marks an epoch in the development of the English language. On the one hand, there is Geoffrey Chaucer, formerly his student. Chaucer laboring to fix the English tongue among the higher classes. But Wycliffe established the English language more permanently in language at once simple and beautiful for his fellow countrymen. It was the great work which hastened on the Reformation in England. At once the hierarchy and clergy of the Roman Church were filled with terror and indignation. For they knew that their occupation was finished if all might, without intervention of the priest, consult the sacred word of God. And so the fury of the persecutor awoke against the followers of Wycliffe. Indeed, a knight and a chronicler of the 14th century writes somewhat scathingly, This master, John Wycliffe, has translated into English the gospel which Christ gave to his clergy and doctors of the church to be by them communicated to the weaker sort and laity according to their need. Thence by this means it has become vulgar and more open to laymen and women who can read it than it is to the lettered clerks of good intelligence. And so the pearl of the gospel has been scattered abroad and trodden underfoot by swine. The jewel of the clerics has become the sport of the laity. What before was the heavenly talent for clerks and doctors of the church is now the common property of all. Thank God it has become the common property of all. Then Archbishop Arundel. He wrote to Pope John the 22nd, asking him to condemn the heresy of Wycliffe and his followers. And after severe vituperation, he writes, that wretched and pestilent fellow, that son of the serpent, that herald and child of the Antichrist, he has completed his malice by devising a translation of the scriptures into the mother tongue. Papal bulls flew thick and fast from both Rome and Avignon because when 
Wycliffe translated the scriptures in 1382, there were two popes. And Wycliffe writes of them. These warring popes are two dogs fighting for a bone. Princes should take the bone away and reduce them to the simple simple poverty of Christ. It was bad enough, he says, that many thousands should die and England be sucked dry by begging friars promoting the crusade for money. But much worse, that their victims were killed in their sins, deluded by antichrist pretended absolution and promises of immediate entry into heaven. You see, he knew the identity of the Pope. Pope Gregory declared, John Wycliffe, rector of Lutterworth, professor of divinity, if only he were not a master of errors, has rashly proceeded to such a detestable degree of madness as to assert, dogmatize, and publicly preach erroneous propositions, false, contrary to the faith, and which threaten to overthrow the whole church. Therefore they should cause the said John Wycliffe to be arrested immediately and and laid in jail, where they should obtain his confession and transmit it to him. Furthermore, they must keep the said Wycliffe in custody in chains until I give further orders. Archbishop Arundel and Convocation of Canterbury issue the following prohibition. In 1408, that no unauthorized person should hereafter translate any portion of Holy Scripture into English, and that no such book should be read, either in whole or part, publicly or privately, that was composed in the time of John Wycliffe or since, under the penalty of the greater excommunication till the said translation be approved by the bishop of the diocese. What a prohibition that was. No one was to read publicly or privately the word of God in English unless the bishop of the diocese had been consulted and granted his approval, which he would not grant. Wycliffe had fully counted the cost and he had weighed the consequences of his actions. He knew that his life would be endangered. In his work, Trilogus, which I've already referred to, he says this, we have no need to go among the heathen in order to die a martyr's death. We only have to preach persistently the gospel of Christ in the hearing of the Pope prelates and instantly we shall have a flourishing martyrdom if we hold out in faith and patience. Oh, he had counted the cost. But through the efforts of Wycliffe's poor preachers and others, the scriptures were circulated, and their pages were opened to the delighted view of many thousands of his fellow countrymen. The Lollards lived in poverty, and they preached the pure gospel to the people. And it was they who carried the torch of the English Bible from the 14th century through the 15th century and on into the 16th century. And through their incessant labors, the people were led to see that the Church of Rome had corrupted the faith once delivered unto the saints. And many were led to cast off the superstitions of their forefathers. In the last two years of his life, 1382 to 1384, Wycliffe devoted himself to writing. Dr. Anne Hudson of Lady Margaret Hall, Oxford, has identified 132 writings of Wycliffe. Some 82 of them are in Latin, the remainder, the other 50, are in English. Many of these works were found in Bohemia. In 1401, Jerome of Prague returned home from Oxford, bearing with him a painting which he hung in his room, showing Wycliffe as the prince of preachers. He also took 
a copy of Wycliffe's work, Triologus, written in Wycliffe's own hand. And Jerome of Prague would say to his students, young men, he who does not study the works of Wycliffe will never find true knowledge. Soon afterwards, John Huss, Jerome's fellow reformer and martyr, translated the treatise into the Czech, and it was circulated throughout Bohemia. And over a century later, Martin Luther possessed a copy written in the year 1400. The last large work of Wycliffe was on the Sermon on the Mount. Come with me, if you can, in your sanctified imagination for a few moments, to that little rectory at Lutterworth. There in that rectory in the study, Wycliffe writes his last pages. In a silence broken only by the scratching of a quill pen and the fall of ashes in the hearth, his lofty brow careworn by study and suffering, his left leg shrunken and lame, that trembling eager hand The whole figure of the man, broken prematurely by misfortune, and yet persevering to the end, writing, teaching the word of God. His final work was divided into two parts, of which the last two were entitled De Antichristo, of the Antichrist. They were never actually completed, for the man who was copying it signed the manuscript in Latin, the author's life finished with this work. The first two books were devoted to quotations and homilies and comments on the Beatitudes taken from the fathers, notably from Wycliffe's favourites, Augustine and Crossetest, In the section on the Antichrist, he attacked the hypocrisy of the Church of Rome, beginning with the Bishop of Rome himself, going down through the various blind guides of the Church, and repeated with clarity and power and authority Christ's denunciation of the false teachers in Rome. He said, woe unto you Pharisees, hypocrites. Like Luther at the Diet of Worms, Wycliffe remained unshaken, unshaken, declaring that if there were a hundred popes and every friar a cardinal, their opinions on matters of faith were only to be accepted in so far as they agreed with Scripture. He asserted the total sufficiency and authority of God's law, as he called the Bible, to meet every contingency of life. So much so that when John Huss came to copy his treatise, he called it the sufficiency of God's law. Wycliffe ended by declaring that he was willing to be taught the truth according to the scripture, but otherwise he was willing to face death as a martyr, and so pass on to be with Christ, which is far better. In deep humility, he confessed, I I am ignorant of much because of the loftiness of the subject itself. But in the fatherland, I shall see clearly the views about which now I only can stammer. In answer to the interrogation of Archbishop Arundel, William Thorpe, a brave Lollard, described Wycliffe as the most virtuous and godly man that ever I heard or ever I knew. John Wycliffe spent his last days at Lutterworth in much weakness. The burdens he had carried, his indefatigable energy, a feature of his character, had gradually worn out the material tabernacle of his body. 
His personal character was unimpeachable. Not one of his enemies could utter a syllable against his personal character. At the close of his life, he had to be carried into his pulpit at Lutterworth. Thorpe refers to Wycliffe's emaciated frame, spare and well-nigh destitute of strength. He had a stroke in 1382, as a result of which he was lame, added to which he had severe rheumatism, from which he sought relief by mustard plasters. He suffered greatly, especially as pain of mind from his God-given task, overwhelmed him in distress. Perhaps his last sermon was on the text of John 21 and verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Listen to the final words that came from the lips of John Wycliffe. Christ taught the apostles to feed his sheep in pastures of Holy Scripture, not in the rotten pastures as are fables and lies of religious men. The pasture, ever more green with truths, that never fail is the law of holy writ that endureth in the other world. But because a good shepherd should keep his sheep from wolves, defend them from the scabs and from rending, therefore Christ bade Peter thrice that he should keep his sheep. Christ taught, taught not his shepherd to raise a crusade and kill his sheep with the lambs and spoil them of their goods. This is Antichrist teaching. And that fiend has brought in, and by this it is known, that these are not Peter's vicars. Many of Wycliffe's friends had, like Demas with the Apostle Paul, forsaken him. His friend and colleague, Nicholas of Hereford, had fled the country, was imprisoned for life by Pope Urban VI in the dungeon of St. Angelo in Rome. In his last days, Wycliffe stood alone, with the sword of persecution suspended by a thread hanging over him. But still, with voice and pen, he labored incessantly to effect reform in the church. He unflinchingly had denounced the arrogancy of the priests and their corruptions of the truth of God's word. He had lived to see his teaching condemned as heresy, his followers harassed. And he had been warned by that first stroke that his days here upon earth were numbered. Nevertheless, he worked with feverish haste before night should fall, with a mind obdurate and inflexible, that he might leave a mass of literature to be drawn upon and broadcast by his disciples after his death. Wycliffe, but a man like John Knox, he feared neither king nor antichrist and his cardinals. If need be, Wycliffe was well prepared to die for the cause of God and truth. In 1383, Wycliffe was summoned by the Pope to go to Rome to answer charges of heresy. Wycliffe's response was to call upon his supporters among the knights of the shires to come forward as soldiers of Christ against that antichrist in Rome who claimed lordship over all their lives. And this is Wycliffe's response to the Pope. So, a certain feeble and lame man is cited by the Roman Curia. Well, this... Certain feeble and lame man replies that I am prevented by a royal prohibition. The king of kings has effectually willed that I shall not go to Rome. 
on December the 28th, 1384, at the age of 64, he suffered a stroke in his church at Lutworth while conducting the service of the Lord's Supper. He was carried to his house where he breathed his last on the 31st of December 1384. Let me just pause at that point to make this comment. Several years ago I was asked to give a talk to children on the subject of John Wycliffe. And I mentioned this incident where he was celebrating the Lord's Supper. Unbeknown to me, there was a a lady in the congregation, a lady who claims to be a preacher in a Methodist church. And she took grave exception to my saying he was celebrating the Lord's Supper. Why don't you be honest? It was the Romish Mass he was celebrating, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I had to rebuke the lady. It wasn't the Romish Mass that he was celebrating at all. In the spring of 1381, Wycliffe posted up at Oxford 12 propositions denying the dogma of transubstantiation and challenging all of the contrary opinion to a debate with him. This is what he said. The consecrated host which we see upon the altar is neither Christ nor any part of him, but an efficacious sign of him. He declared that the words of consecration in no wise change their substance. The bread and wine are as really bread and wine after as before their consecration. So the elements are bread really and Christ's body only figuratively and spiritually. The Chancellor of the University, William Barton, summoned a Council of Twelve, which condemned Wycliffe's teaching on the Eucharist as heretical. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, Courtney, Wycliffe's arch enemy, instructed the Pope to strike off the head of this heresy in England, and it was for this very doctrine, the simplicity of the Lord's Supper, as opposed to To the myth of the Mass, it was for that that he was condemned. So it was not the Romish Mass at all. It was the Lord's Supper that he was celebrating there when he had that stroke on the 28th of December 1384. Walsingham, one of his enemies, announced that on the feast of the Passion of St. Thomas of Canterbury, John Wycliffe, that instrument of the devil, the enemy of the church, the confusion of men, the idol of heresy, the mirror of hypocrisy, the nourisher of schism, was by the rightful doom of God smitten with a horrible paralysis throughout his body. And this vengeance fell upon him at St. Thomas's day, but he died not until St. Sylvester's day. And worthily was he smitten on St. Thomas's day, against whom he had greatly offended, stopping men of that pilgrimage. And convenient died he in Sylvester Feast, against whom he venomously barked and breathed out his malicious spirit unto the abodes of darkness. Good to have enemies like that, isn't it? At the Council of Constance, the Church of Rome... Determined to wreak her impotent fury upon the bones of John Wycliffe. So it was in 1415, a decree was passed, branding Wycliffe as a heretic, directing that his body and bones should be taken from consecrated ground and thrown away from the burial of the church. That decree was carried out in 1428, 44 years after his death. As I close in this section, let us picture the scene that day in Lutterworth Church. Let us wander back to that distant age. Around the grave of Wycliffe in the chancel is the Archbishop himself. 
Chichili. And there is also Bishop Fleming of Lincoln, once a devoted follower of Wycliffe. There are other dignitaries and clergy anxious to display their enmity to one who had denounced the corruptions of their church. The church is crowded with officials, with townspeople who are, tra- are attracted by the novelty of the spectacle. The sound of the pickaxe falls on the ear. And slowly rising through the opening thus made is seen the coffin of John Wycliffe. It is lifted out of the tomb and placed on the shoulders of men. It is then carried through the door in the chancel which is still standing down the winding road to the river Swift which glides along tranquilly at the foot of the hill there in Lutterworth. When they come to the river, a fire is kindled on the bridge. The coffin is then opened, and the bones of that godly man, John Wycliffe, are taken out of that coffin and are flung into the fire where they are reduced to ashes and afterwards tossed into the river. Many in that crowd would doubtless behold with tears the indignities they had offered to the remains of one to whom they had listened in their youth as he had preached to them of the love of the Saviour, as he had warned them to prepare for death, for judgment and for eternity. They would recall the many times when he had visited them in their homes and spoken to them in time of sickness and sorrow and heartache, pouring the oil and wine of heavenly consolation into their wounded spirits. They see his bones reduced to ash and tossed into the river. The brook did convey the ashes into the river Avon, the river Avon into the river Severn, the river Severn into the Bristol Channel and the narrow seas, and then into the main ocean itself. And thus the ashes of Wycliffe are the emblem of his doctrine, which now is dispersed all over the world. Wycliffe, is, in my opinion, and it is my opinion, the greatest man that our country has ever produced. He had a burning love for Christ, an ardent desire for the salvation of precious souls. He truly deserves to be called the morning star of the Reformation. Oh, that the Lord would raise up men like John de Wycliffe in our day and in our age. Amen.